Hi there, I'm Bayless Conley, and I'm very glad that you've chosen to join me today. I've got a message that I'm gonna share with you, and I sort of swiped the title from a very popular movie called Eat, Pray, Love, but it lined up with uh, something that the Bible taught, and I'll talk a little bit about the movie and give you a little intro for the sermon, but I think you're gonna find it perhaps a little funny, uh, I hope illuminating, and I trust that it's gonna feed your spirit and give you some direction for your life. You know, I, I, I wouldn't attend a church that didn't feed my spirit. Jesus talked about his words being bread. And uh, you know, we, we need to feed upon the word of God. It's called, you know, the milk of the word. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so the purpose of this message is not just to entertain you, but it is to feed you. And I believe as you feed upon the Word of God, you will grow spiritually, your faith will grow unconsciously. And so I'm expecting good things from our time together today. So let's get into the Word. Recently, there was a best-selling book out written by Elizabeth Gilbert called Eat, Pray, Love. They made it into a popular motion, motion picture starring Julia Roberts. The film had the same name, Eat, Pray, Love. So I was reading in Colossians the other day, it seemed to me, especially in chapters 3 and 4, that that was the very advice that Paul was giving to the church at Colossae. Eat, pray, love. And I believe if we'll do those three things, we'll be all right. And I want to look at each one of them one at a time. Let's begin with eat. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. But now yourselves, but now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. He talks about putting off your old behavior, all the old sinful things and put on your new nature. He's literally talking about let the good things that God has put inside of you, in your spirit, the part of you that got born again when you accepted Christ, let that translate out now into your lifestyle, into your relationships, into your speech, into your actions. Put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge. And the word renewed means to be refreshed, to be strengthened. And that, that, that inner person is refreshed and strengthened by knowledge, and that is by the knowledge of God. Even as he puts it in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Well, if it can dwell in us richly, it can also dwell in us poorly. If it can dwell in us richly, it can dwell, dwell in us weakly or not at all. It can dwell in us strong or weak, rich or poor, a lot or a little, or not at all. And that's the key to putting off those things that we shouldn't be doing and shouldn't be expressing, and they're poisoning our relationships and hurting our life, to put those things off and to bring out the new that's been put in our spirit. The key is to renew that inward person, to refresh that inward person with God's Word. I'd like you to mark this place because wherever we go today, we'll come back to Colossians 3 and 4. And turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. He speaks of the same thing here. Ephesians 4 and 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Right, the new man, your spirit, the real you that lives inside of that body has been created righteous and holy. God has put something very wonderful inside of you. But getting what's on the inside to the outside is a process. And the key is renewing our mind and feeding our spirit, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Now look at one more place with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul speaks of it again there. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. 
2 Corinthians 4 and 16. <clears throat> it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed, refreshed and strengthened day by day. Everyone say day by day. This inward person needs to be renewed day by day, daily. Not week by week, not month by month, but day by day. Now to paraphrase all of this, this language about being renewed in the spirit of your mind, you know, the inward man being renewed by knowledge, being renewed day by day, to paraphrase it all, it just comes down to this. Eat. Feed on God's Word. We feed our physical body physical food in order for it to be strengthened and renewed and refreshed daily. And we need to learn to feed upon the Word of God so our inward person can be renewed and refreshed and strengthened daily. Jeremiah put it this way. He said to God in Jeremiah 15, 16, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, Jeremiah just said the same thing that the Apostle Paul was talking about, but he put it in a little simpler language. Your words were found, and I ate them. And they were the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, of my spirit, of my inward person. Look with me in the book of Ezekiel, if you would, chapter 3. Ezekiel, the third chapter, there's a few verses we want to read here. It shares the same principle. Verse 1, Ezekiel 3. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this, this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. And he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. Eat the scroll. The scroll had God's Word upon it. And you know, before the man of God speaks the Word of God, he needs to feed upon the Word of God. Before we share the Word, we need to feed upon the Word. You know, even in Revelation chapter 10, the angel said to John, take this little book. It was a little book with God's words on it, and eat the little book. And John said, I ate the little book. We need to feed upon God's Word. Because among other things, the Word of God is food for our spirit. 1 Peter 2 and 2, desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, spoke of the Word of God as being both milk and as solid food. You know, we have some very, very dear friends, yet unfortunately one of their family members has been chronically anorexic. For years and years and years, everything she eats, she purges. And to see a picture of her, you almost want to look away. She's like a living skeleton. Literally just looks like flesh pulled over a skeleton. It is so sad. She has no energy, no strength. It's very limited as to what she can do. She's in no position to help anyone else. She certainly can't strengthen anyone else. And the sad thing is, many of God's children are the same way spiritually. The outer person is very well fed, but the inward person is starving, emaciated. There's no inward strength, there's no faith, because faith is a byproduct of feeding upon the Word of God. It's not a faith problem, it's a Word problem. If you'll find the words and eat them and feed upon it, it will fix the faith issue. I mean, just think, if you fed your body as little as you feed your spirit, what shape your physical body might be in? Silah. Pause and calmly think on that. But on the other hand, just think what strength and faith and energy there would be in your spirit if you fed your spirit anywhere near as systematically as you feed your body. And friend, feeding your spirit is more important than feeding your body. Of course, we need to feed both. Some people don't have the strength to put off the old behavior and let what's on the inside come to the outside because the inward person is never, ever fed. You see, it's 
food for our spirit, but as well it allows us to put on our inward nature, to express it outwardly and allow it to dominate our speech and our actions. We all know the verse in Romans 12 too. It says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or experience that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Anybody in here want to experience the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Man, I do. But the key to letting that happen is renewing our minds. Otherwise, we end up conformed to the pressures of this world. We end up living, you know, the, the world's way and expressing, you know, the, the worldly desires and following worldly lust. And the only way to be transformed, and that Greek word transformed literally means to let what God's put on the inside come to the outside. The only way to, to let this inward nature, and Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see this other law in my body wanting to pull me the wrong direction. He wrote about that, that battle in Galatians between his spirit and what God had done in his spirit and his flesh. Because we do have this treasure in an earthen vessel. Your spirit's been born again, is beautiful, is holy, has been made just, but your body still has the nature of sin in it. One day, we'll get a new body like onto his glorious body, but in the meantime, we're stuck in these. My body has been trained to do naughty things for a long time. And if I let it have its way, it will pull me the wrong direction every time. The only way that I can put off the old and put on the new and let what God's put on the inside be expressed to the outside is to be renewed by knowledge. You see, if I'll renew my mind and feed my spirit, then my well-fed and strengthened and refreshed spirit and my renewed mind will gang up on my flesh and make it submit, and I will walk in the way of God's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But on the other hand, if I don't feed upon the Word of God, my unrenewed mind and my flesh will gang up on my spirit that is weak, and it'll pull me the way of the flesh every time. Friend, listen, your flesh is a bully. It takes a renewed mind and a well-fed spirit to put it in its place. Otherwise, for the rest of your life, you will be dominated by your flesh. You know, Paul said, hey, I put my body under. I make it submit to me. But you can't do it if you don't eat. Everybody say eat. eat. All right, the next word is pray. Look back with me in the book of Ephesians, or, or the book of Colossians, if you would. Chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4 pray. Colossians 4 and 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. And the phrase continue earnestly means to persevere. Now that indicates there's going to be resistance. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to persevere. If prayer was easy, he wouldn't say that. You ever wonder how you can sit down for two and a half hours and watch a movie? And it's like, man, I, I, I can't even, I can't go to the bathroom. I got to go bad, but I don't want to miss this part. Is you there, or you read the Sunday paper from cover to cover, but when you kneel down to pray, your mind is assailed by distractions, and you find yourself, you know, transported miraculously to in front of the refrigerator, you know, with the doors open, you're thinking, what can I eat? <laughs> Listen, when prayer is dry and dull and uninspired, persevere. When your mind is assailed, with distractions, persevere. You know, it used to be every time I would go to pray, it's like there was, you know, something sitting on each one of my shoulders. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to call this person. Don't forget to take care of that. Oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to. And so I got, finally, it just was driving me crazy. I got to where I'd have a pad of paper and a pencil with me when I kneel down to pray, and I'd make my to-do list. And so I'd, I'd write all these things, and then finally I started saying, all right, devil, is there anything else? You're helping me. I am going to spend my hour praying, but I'll, I'll get these things done. Anything else you can think of that I'm forgetting that I'll need to do later? <laughs> and he stopped helping me after a while. Now, there are unseen forces that would like to stop us from praying. And he said being vigilant in it. The word vigilant means to stay awake. It's one reason it's not always wise to pray laying down. That's called snoozing before the Lord. But it implies being alert and aware. 
because there's things to see and things to hear in the place of prayer. The Holy Spirit will show you things to pray for and people to pray for and tell you things that you need to know. And I think that's another reason the devil fights it so. And he said, when you pray, do it with thanksgiving. We thank God when we offer our petitions, that's faith. And we thank God after the answers come, that's gratitude. But thanksgiving is a big part of our praying. In verse 3, he said, Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Pray for open doors, opportunities to share the word, and also, it re refers to receptive hearts. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is depicted as standing before the door of someone's heart and knocking. And Paul saying, hey, pray that hearts will be receptive and pray for open doors of opportunity to share the gospel. And he said, for which I'm in chains. He's asking for opportunities while he's in Roman custody. And God answered those prayers. You can read in Philippians, which is also one of his prison epistles in chapter 1. He said, you know, my, my imprisonment has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. The entire praetorian guard has heard the gospel because I've been here. Those were the most elite forces of all of Rome. They're sort of the Roman ninja warriors. And he said, they've been evangelized because I've been here. God does open doors that no man can shut when we pray. He does. Watchman Nee, put in prison in China. And yet, he would write letters to the church, and they would go out throughout all of China and inspire and encourage thousands of believers. And the, the, the government authorities realized that he was winning the guards to Christ, and the guards were taking the letters out. And so they decided, all right, from, from this point forward, no guard is allowed to guard him more than one time. And they changed the shifts to six hours. You can only guard Watchman Nee once, never again, and only for six hours. And the letters continued to go out. He would win those guards to Christ in six hours, and they still carried his letters out. Friend, that, that's a re response to prayer. Those are doors that God opens. I read the story of an evangelist in Bangladesh sitting in his office. The door opens, a man walks in, levels a revolver at his face, and stands there for a minute, and then runs out. I just thought that was kind of odd. Five minutes later, gets a phone call, and the man identifies himself as the one that stood before him with the revolver in his hand five minutes before. And the evangelist said it kind of struck him funny. He says, well, is there anything else I can do to help you? And the guy said, well, when I was there, I couldn't pull the trigger. My finger wouldn't work and my arm wouldn't work, and it still won't work. Can you help me? The evangelist prayed for him, and God healed him. He had instant mobility in his arm. He said, can I come see you? Came back over, sat down. The evangelist made tea for them. He shared the gospel, and the guy gets saved. Friend, those things happen in response to prayer. But that's not the end of the story. It was actually a leader from another religion that was local there that hired this man to assassinate the evangelist so that he would not continue to preach Jesus anymore. And the evangelist found out who it was that had hired this assassin to come and kill him. And he went to the man's house. And the guy wasn't there, but his daughter-in-law and son were there. The son had been ill for 18 years. Hadn't been out of bed at this time in months and months. The evangelist went in, was allowed to come in, prayed for him, and God instantly healed the son. Well, the, the man comes home that had paid this reward, you know, for the assassination, walks in, here's the evangelist having a meal with his son and daughter-in-law, and he flies out and says, what is this infidel doing in my house? What are you doing having a meal with him? The daughter-in-law jumps up and says, you don't understand. This man came here, he shared Jesus with us, he laid hands on my husband, your son, and he has been healed by this Jesus. The son jumped up and testified, said, Daddy, you know I've been sick for 18 years. It's the first time I've never had pain in my body. And, and the man's anger changed to rejoicing. The son got, got saved, the daughter-in-law got saved. Now, the man didn't accept Christ, but he came a cha became a champion for the gospel. He helped get Christians out of prison. He, he stopped a lot of the persecution that was happening in the villages there and opened doors for them to share Christ. Paul said, pray that God will open doors. 
We need to pray for our leaders and pray for those that are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. Because, friend, Jesus does still open doors. All right, our last word is love. Everybody say love. Look with me, if you would, in chapter 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And I like verse 14 from the Living Bible. It said, most of all, let love guide your life, for then the whole church will stay together in perfect harmony. Love is the glue that holds us together. And maybe you have a complaint against someone. It may be legitimate. I just want to encourage you, always take the high road. Don't retaliate with cursing. Retaliate with blessing. Jesus said, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. The New Testament says, if we will bless those that do us wrong, we will inherit a blessing. And I know it's not always easy. I'm always inspired when I think of Corey Ten Boom's story. She and her sister Betsy put in a German concentration camp during the Second World War. The guards brutalized the women, raped them. They were starved. Her sister Betsy died. Corey got out because of a clerical error. I believe her father was put in. He died 10 days after he was put in a camp. That and other things had happened in her life, and she was finding it hard to forgive. She went to a local Lutheran pastor and confessed, and I, I don't know if I'm loving the way I'm commanded to love in the Bible. I don't know that I'm able to forgive like Christ because these, these feelings wash over me, these emotions still wash over me, and I toss and turn, and I can't sleep at night. And the pastor wisely took her up into the bell tower of the church, gave a tug on the rope, and the big bell clanged and clanged and clanged, and eventually slowed down, and it stopped and became quiet. He said, Corey, to love is a choice. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit has been given to us. To forgive is a choice. And when we choose to love and choose to forgive, it's like letting go of the rope. It'll still resonate and make noise in our soul for a while, but eventually it will become quiet if we stop pulling on the rope. You see, when we rehearse things and constantly go over and tell somebody else how I've been wronged and you know what this person did for me, we're continually pulling on the rope. Some people pull on it for years and it clangs in their soul and they think about those, those issues and they, they, they get angry all over again, but it's because they keep pulling on the rope. Friend, we can forgive. We can let things go. I'd like you to just bow your heads, close your eyes for a moment if you would. Anyone that's listening to me right now, You've never connected with God if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. If you want to know Him. You may not be interested in ritual or ceremony. I'm not talking about that. But if you want a relationship with God, know that His Son died on the cross to take away your sins, was raised on the third day. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you'll tie your heart around these words and be sincere, God will meet you. Say it after me. Say, Oh God, I come to you today, and I thank you for such an exquisite love, a love so amazing that you would send your son to die for enemies. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross, taking my sin, taking my shame, dying in my place. I believe you were raised from the dead. I make a decision today. I give my life and my heart to you. Wherever you lead me, I will go. I confess you as Lord. My heart is yours. My life is yours. All I am is yours, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. I hope 
you just prayed that prayer that I led the congregation in, if you meant it from your heart and you prayed it, God heard you. You know, God does listen. He is not far away. He's not aloof. He's not uninterested. But He's very near, and He does care about you. We care about you as well. If I could come into your home or your apartment, wherever you live, and sit down across the kitchen table, have a cup of tea with you, and just share a little bit, hear your story, um, where you've come from, what you've been through, I would love to do that. I'd love to take hands with you and pray with you. But obviously, that's not possible. This is the next best thing. So take this as me coming into your, your kitchen or your living room and just sitting down and, and being able to share with you. I just want you to know that God really does care for you and He does have plans for your life. So whatever you've gone through, whatever you might be going through now, God wants to help you. And uh, if you did pray that prayer, why don't you let me know? Send me an email. Um, just say, hey, Bayless, been watching the broadcast, been a blessing to me. That would encourage my heart. Um, if you've accepted Christ, uh, let me know that. Uh, visit our website. We've got all sorts of things you can research there. There's messages archived, uh, some things that can help you grow spiritually. And I want to encourage you as well. Why don't you pray about uh, maybe being a supporter of what we're doing. It's very expensive to take the gospel around the world, and it doesn't happen without people like you. So if you have been blessed, why don't you reciprocate and in turn sow a blessing this way so that we can reach somebody else with the good news of Jesus. See you next time.